Well, this month here on the Classic Pay-Per-View Review, I wanted to look at a couple of shows, turning the clock back to the year 1989. WCW still trying to find their identity in this Jim Hurd era, trying to compete with the World Wrestling Federation, but still largely considered a distant second, even by their own parent company. The company is trying to build new stars, trying to claim stars that have not been signed lately, including a returning Terry Funk, but that's a story for the main event. We are going to look here though at WCW's Wrestle War 89 Music City Showdown from May 7th at the Nashville Municipal Auditorium in Nashville, Tennessee. This show was nominated by Leo Whoa! on patreon.com slash wrestling with regret. It is the first Wrestle War. 5,200 folks at the auditorium, 120,000 pay-per-view buys down just a bit from Shy town Rumble back in February. That was the show where Ricky Steamboat won the World Championship. Championship. Not a great turnout for this show. Not a huge gate either. Somewhere in the thirty-five dollars to $37,000 range. And there were a lot of possible factors for this. Like I mentioned, you know, there was that perception the company was less than the WWF. Uh, it was the bastard child of the Turner family. It wasn't really well promoted on those networks they had because the only person in the company who seemed to care that WCW was there was Ted Turner, the man who bought it out of that sentimental attachment they had uh, with wrestling on TBS. Um, it was not not promoted very well locally because apparently there was a fear that it was going to affect the house show market in that time and so it negatively it ended up ne negatively impacting the house for the bigger show. Also Mania 5 had just happened around this time as perhaps there was some big wrestling fatigue around that as well. You know I don't think it's very indicative of the quality of the show. I don't think that uh, you know the attendance is reflective of the quality of the show itself because there are, there is a lot of good to be mined from Wrestle War but yeah it's just one of those times where they're just, again, trying to gain relevance. They're trying to gain momentum and market share. And right now, they're just kind of a low place. But I got to say, I love this venue. I've been to the Nashville Municipal Auditorium a couple of times. I went there once uh, when I worked for ROH. I went there to cover Ric Flair's last match a couple of years ago. And the times I'd been in there, just like looking up at the ceiling, that dome, those lights, and uh, just kind of taking in the ambiance and the history there. I got goosebumps when I was in that building. It was really cool to see it here as well. Wow. Well, those first few names of the opening package just fly by. It's very fast there. Jim Ross and Bob Cottle are on the call here. The Oak Ridge Boys sing the national anthem. We'll be hearing from them later. Then we see JR announcing that the U.S. tag title match coming up tonight, the stipulation that was advertised involving hair versus hair, has been snipped, so to speak. The board has stepped in and they say Eddie Gilbert and Kevin Sullivan should settle their issues on their own time, but not with the tag belt on the line, which is so weird and antithetical to hear about any kind of wrestling. When have you ever heard of like, hey, now this is a championship match. No personal business in this. So no hair versus hair step on the match. Way to defang your last match well before it even begins. We get this rundown of the matches on the evening, all these like matchup graphics and everything. There's only one match graphic that gave me pause and I want to just pull it up here and just and pull the viewers because I wanted to get your opinion on this. What the hell is on Bob Orton's t-shirt? We see this like hand gripping something. Uh, the detail's not that great. I can't really see what that airbrushed design is. I really hope it's not what I think it is. Please somebody help me out here. Also, what happened to Mike Rotunda's shirt in this chroma key nightmare? And how does the world title match get third highest billing? Our opening matchup sees a young Doug Gilbert take on the great Muta, who is accompanied by Gary Hart. Gilbert is the younger brother of Hot Stuff Eddie, who we'll be seeing later on this show. He's a last minute replacement because as you saw in the opening graphics, the first match was supposed to be Muta versus the Junkyard Dog, but JYD no-showed this event uh, without notice. He was fired as a result of no-showing. He would be brought back to WCW a year later though under the new booker, Ole Anderson. Muta debuted not too long ago and is already a presence. He kicks Gilbert down mid-ritual, he spews some mist, and proceeds with the beating. Gilbert puts up a fight, but it's really all Muta. As Hot Stuff Eddie Gilbert shows up to be in his brother's corner at one point, Muta lands on his feet in a moonsault attempt, does a dive to the outside, hits the moonsault for real the second attempt, Muta gets the win and spews some celebratory red mist. 
I give it one star out of five. It's a short and sweet matchup here, clearly designed to be a squash for Muta, whether JYD was part of it or not, but I think it was at least good that Gilbert got a couple of moments to shine and get a little bit of offense in this one. Eddie showing up in the match like partway through and just doing really nothing, I thought that was kind of like, didn't seem to serve a purpose to me, but you know, at least it gave Gilbert some more fire when he was there. Lance Russell is backstage with Ric Flair. He's putting Steamboat over as the greatest wrestler alive today, but reiterates he still has to beat him, that's Flair, one more time. And of course, he is the man. Your next matchup sees Hacksaw Butch Reed taking on Ranger Ross, who's accompanied by the color guard. And, oh, it's Camo Pants or Tearaways. That was neat. Ross is off to a good start with the headlock takeovers. Reed comes out of the corner with a big old clothesline, though. As the match goes on, in comes Theodore Long, a former recently fired referee. He lost his job due to incompetence, according to the storyline. He's showing off his visitor's pass and is taking notes. There's some foreshadowing there. Hacksaw using the ropes for leverage on a chin lock, which seems to apply more pressure based on the selling, but I don't know. Finally, he gets caught by the referee. Ranger Ross comes back, does a big running leap over the ropes, and lands on his feet to do some punching. Oh, that's kind of disappointing. Reed comes back, hits a fly shoulder tackle to win the match. I give it two stars out of five. It's a hard hitting match, especially near the end, but there's really not much to it uh, beyond that. There's no heat, there's no build. Uh, if you listen to Jim Ross talking about it on Grilling JR when they covered this a few years ago, he says, oh, well, they just put the two black guys in a match together because they didn't know what else to do with them. And uh, he may be correct about that, he may not be, but yeah, it's just uh, kind of a match that's just there. Lance Russell is in the promo zone with the US champion Lex Luger. Now, Michael Hayes says that he's gonna come for the title all by himself. Himself, but is Lex prepared for all that Hayes has done in the past? What a weird question that was. Lex calling out Michael's track record when it comes to his integrity. He says Hayes does not have what it takes to take the belt from him. Our next matchup is of the bull rope variety as Captain Redneck Dick Murdoch takes on Bob Orton, who's accompanied by Gary Hart. There is a lot of heat between these two. I think the build for this on TV is pretty strong because it's getting really personal. Like Orton and Gary Hart are talking trash about Dick Murdoch's kid. Like they're really going there. And this gets that, that kind of justifies the uh, grit and the vitriol needed for this bull rope match. Murdoch keeps trying to swing the cowbell down with all his might early on, but Orton is able to stop his momentum and fight back. Brawling goes to the outside. Orton tries to run away for some reason, but predictably gets stopped. Back in the ring, Orton starts taking over, wearing him down in the corner. Murdoch takes his boot off and starts hitting Orton with it at one point, wearing the boot like a glove. Orton's back on the offensive. He goes up top but is yoinked off the rope. Murdoch hog ties Orton and rolls him up for the win. Gary Hart runs in because this awkward tussle as Orton gets back up and attacks Murdoch. He wraps the rope around his neck, hangs him over the ropes, even stomps the head a couple of times. It looks just brutal. Even more brutal though is how the fans respond. They do not seem to care about this one lick. I give it one and a half stars out of five. Uh, having a bull rope match with no blood is like a war games match with no blood. You just there's an expectation there and when there's not it's like, eh, it just feels like a little less than, like you're missing something there. That being said, I thought the hog tie finish, that got a laugh out of me, so I had to give them credit for that at least. Lance Russell backstage asking Michael Hayes, can he really beat Lex Luger on his own? He says he's got what it takes to take what Luger's got. No free birds, he's on his own. Remember that now. The wise young man, Paulie, dangerously in the ring, introducing Samu and Fatu, the Samoan SWAT team, as they take on Shane and Johnny, the dynamic dudes running in with those skateboards they never actually ride. Johnny and Fatu start things off. The face buster has no effect, but stepping on Fatu's toes does. Johnny and Shane with the quick tags, looking strong at first, but Johnny leapfrogs Samu and lands into a kick by Fatu. There's some double teaming here by the SST as Johnny's worked over extensively. Samu with a big gloop as he applies the heat. Johnny with another face buster. This time it slows him down at least. Paul E decides to get on the live mic to get some additional heat. You are a Useless as a woman from Nashville, Tennessee! Hot tag to Shane, who is a house of fire. Fatu with a big old splash off the top, but Johnny Ace breaks up the pinfall. Fatu's got Shane up. Johnny with a missile drop kick on his own partner to knock them both down. The cover and the win by the dudes. I give it two and a half stars out of five. Now, needless to say, history does not look kindly upon the dynamic dudes, but just in this context here, in a bubble, I think it's a solid tag team match. I think both teams show off their strength really well. I think uh, each team's tandem offense 
defense is fun to watch. And, uh, you know, Johnny and Shane, obviously they're pretty athletic at this point. You know, I think they have some good qualities about them as wrestlers at this point, but as a team and as a concept, it's very inauthentic, very low ceiling, very short shelf life. Now here's a promo you won't find on the Peacock version of this show. It's the final cat. It's an amazing hype package for the Flair Steamboat rivalry, showing all their previous matchups earlier in the year and some promo snippets as is leading to this final encounter here, where they're just superimposing the WCW footage over Europe's music video. It is so cheesy, but it also kicks ass. Up next, the Oak Ridge Boys with a live performance. Oh man, look at how they run in place. This concert goes on for 20 plus minutes in this wrestling show. Lance Russell backstage with the judges for tonight's world title match. Luthez, Pat O'Connor, and Terry Funk. The judges basically say they're going to do a good job at determining who does the best wrestles if the match ends in a time limit draw. I think they're going to wrestle too fast for us to have to make a decision. In your first of five championship matches on the evening, Lex Luger defends the U.S. title against Michael P.S. Hayes, who's accompanied by Hiro Matsuda of the Yamazaki Corporation. These two are technically former tag team partners. That's the story they're going with here because Hayes uh, came back to WCW as a singles wrestler at this point. He teams up with Lex Luger and immediately turns on him to join up with Hiro Matsuda's corporation. And uh, that's how basically we get this matchup here. And of course, the build to this, every promo Michael Hayes has uttered in the build for this is him been saying, I'm going to win this on my own. No free birds. I can win without Buddy Roberts. I can win without Terry Gordy. Like it's, I'm going to be doing this all on my own. Hayes led to the ring by Matsuda also comes out to free bird by Leonard Skinner. What a cool moment that was. He gets pyro too. What a heel. The match starts off with lots of headlocks, a lot of shtick between both guys. And I'm falling in love with this already. Hayes goes for a Russian leg sweep, but Luger just kind of falls back. A couple minutes later, Hayes goes for a DDT, but Luger pulls himself away. That looked intentional where the Russian leg sweep from earlier did not. Luger grabs the arm and works on it for a long while. Hayes gets back up. Luger looking strong. Goes for a leaping attack but flies out of the ring instead. There's that strut. Hayes starts putting on the pressure. A beautiful left jab by P.S. followed by the Bulldog. On the outside, Mr. Matsuda with the attack of the referee distracted. Luger fights up from the chin lock. Blocks another Bulldog attempt and makes his comeback. Many press slams. Hayes slips out of the torture rack attempt. Hits the DDT and both men are down. Both men get up. Nick Patrick takes a glancing blow. The Patrick flop as Luger and Hayes knock heads. Luger is out. Hayes is out. But then Terry Gordy shows up. Shoves Hayes onto Luger. Patrick makes a three count. Hayes wins and is the new U.S. champion. But uh, uh, he didn't really do it on his own. Now did he? You can't trust those free birds. This one gets four stars out of five for me. You know what? This matchup was an unexpected delight. I was frankly just blown away by this match. And I mean that with all sincerity. Like, you know I've been very up and down with Luger over the years on this channel, but this is frankly one of the best matches of his I've ever seen. And like on paper, I don't expect much from Lex Luger and Michael Hayes, but like this was like a perfect, like just baby face versus heel matchup. Like the moment Luger has him in the corner is like, should I punch him in the face? Like, I mean, I was hooked because that was just like a uh, wonderful storytelling. It's a very simple story told very well. Uh, the timing was good on everything. They had, they played their roles perfectly. And I thought I was just so wrapped up in it, having never seen this match before. And I was just like so invested in it. The ending was a bit of a gut punch, but I think it was still well executed. I think this is the kind of match you could have, you could have that same match any night in any arena and you would get the same reactions every time. I thought it was really well done. Oddly enough though, they do not give Hayes the belt for a very long time. He only loses it like two weeks later at Clash of the Champions back to Lex Luger. Eh? Kind, of, kind of a bummer. I know the man just retired, but we cannot escape this man. Take a look at the rising star in the Stinger. He is the world television champion here with Lance Russell. Sting is just screaming about seeing all these little Stingers out there. He's fired up. Woo! Later! That world TV title on the line as Sting, who's accompanied by the Little Stingers. That's a cool moment. Taking on the Iron Sheik, who's accompanied by Rip Morgan. There's a pretty funny moment between these two like for the build for this matchup. It's on TV where the Iron Sheik challenges Sting to the Persian club swinging competition thing. So Sheik goes first and Sting's like, can you do that again? I didn't see it. Get a good look at it. And so Sheik's like, oh, okay, fine. So he does it again and then he tells Sting to do it and Sting's like, I still don't know how to do it. Can you show me one more time? And so now the Iron Sheik is totally frustrated. He just does it again. But now he's all blown up 
up and Sting's like, ah, no, never mind, you won. And so that was a nice, like, babyface way to, like, get one up on the bad guy without having to fight him, at least. Shiki Baby gets no entrance. That's not a great sign for him, but they are getting the most of that $100,000 a year contract they accidentally let renew recently. The Sheik's corner man, Morgan, hitting Sting from the outside. That allows Shiki Baby to jump Sting with the Iranian flag, but his sneaky ways are no match for the Stinger who gets him back. Then they lock up. Sheik hits a suplex and a clothesline. That's about it for his offense as Sting hits his splash, the Scorpion Deathlock, and Sting wins by submission. Half star out of five for me, it's really not much of a match, but it's about as well as you could expect given the Iron Sheik's mobility at this point. Lance is backstage with the champion, Ricky Steamboat. The dragon also puts Flair over, but he makes it clear he's gonna walk out and remain the champion. Lance, how do you wrap this up? That's it, by golly. Up next, the main event of the show, third to last match on the card, it's the NWA World Championship as Ricky Steamboat defense against Ric Flair. It is the finale of the epic trilogy of theirs that began earlier in the year at Shy town Rumble. It was at that pay-per-view, which I've covered here, Steamboat beat Flair to win the world title. Two months later at Clash of the Champions, running in direct competition with WrestleMania 5, Steamboat wins again in a two out of three falls match, but there is controversy, so we have the rubber match here. And as they mentioned all month, this is Flair's last chance. He's the five-time champion at this point, but oh man, this could be the end of Flair's uh, championship quest here if he loses against Ricky Steamboat. So they say. Here we see Flair and Steamboat's personalities laid bare once again. Flair comes out accompanied by a few ladies. Then they walk down the aisle lined with 40 or so other women, or as JR refers to them as his harem or whatever. Ricky Steamboat makes his entrance alongside his beautiful family. Young Richie is on a horse, and the horse handler is dressed like Colonel Sanders, which legitimately I had to press pause on my video and just like laugh my ass off for five minutes at the sight of that. I don't know why it made me laugh so much. Maybe it was just the con contrast with like Flair, the style of Flair's entrance and the style of Steamboat and I just did not expect that look and I was just like, uh, my brain couldn't handle it. And oh look at this, Richie's got a little guitar, it's adorable. This is simultaneously the most wholesome and most hilarious moment I've seen all week. The match starts off with a lot of speed between these two. We get Steamboat looking a little better than Flair at the onset. We get arm drags, we get slaps, we get chops. Steamboat's working over Flair's arm for a while. Every time Flair tries to come back, Steamboat's got another arm arm drag for him. The judges take their notes throughout. Suddenly, Flair using Ricky's own momentum against him, and out he goes. Fighting on the outside, Flair's got the upper hand, but Steamboat fires up and chases him back into the ring for more punishment. About a minute later, Ricky again flies out of the ring. Flair's finally on the offensive for a sustained period of time. Ricky tries to fight back, but Flair catches him in midair, drops him across the ropes. A suplex on the floor by the challenger. We get more updates from the judges. After two rounds, it's unofficially Steamboat up 4-2. to two. The action picks up in the ring. Flair collides into Steamboat and they both go tumbling out. Flair goes up top and we all know what happens then. They work their way back to the top of the corner. Big superplex by the champ. Steamboat goes the double chicken wing which he's made Flair submit with before but he cannot get it locked in. Steamboat hits a top rope chop up top again but Flair falls into the rope and Steamboat takes a fall outside. Flair gets the figure 4 locked in for a while but they make it to the ropes. Steamboat's left leg is now virtually useless according to JR. Steamboat goes for the slam but Flair rolls through it and covers Ricky for the win. Flair has won his sixth world title. You know, it's cliche to say but I give it five stars. This is just an incredible matchup here. I would say it's either this or Chi-Town Rumble is my favorite in their trilogy here but I mean like take your pick because it's just it's a matter of taste or whatever their vibe is at this point because I think both guys are just so good together. It's, that cl it's one of those classic rivalries where you could watch them wrestle a again and again and you know even though they do a lot of the same sequences they'll do some of the same spots like the emotion the selling the physicality it never really gets old and I think that's why matches like this um, stand the test of time so well I think that it was just you know it was a perfect even though like that feud at that point wasn't really had didn't have the steam didn't have the hook that say like Flair and Dusty did a few years earlier it's still just like an incredible contest between two amazing athletes in their prime. Jim Ross interviewing Flair in the ring. Flair putting Steamboat over for a second and suddenly in comes Terry Funk. 
I think you're the greatest champion of all time. I would have voted for you in the end. I want a challenge for the belt. Are you saying I'm not good enough? Why didn't you come out in a horse, Rick? Boom! Terry Sucker punches Flair and takes him to the outside, pile drives him on the judge's table and bashes him with a chair. Look at the horse tooth banana nose jerk. And man, just like that, Terry Funk back in wrestling in a big way. He'd been gone for a few years at this point making movies. As Ric Flair said in this promo here, he's hanging out with Sylvester Stallone. He had just made Roadhouse with Patrick Swayze. So he'd done the movie thing and now just, just like that, he's back in it and in a big way. He's not messing around, goes right for the big guns in Ric Flair. And what a great transition that is. So they have this decisive end of a rivalry with Flair going over the way he did and then going right into this because he's, he's turning babyface at this point in his career. Like he's practically a face. He certainly is treated like one in this matchup and for the entrance for sure. And then Terry Funk jumps him. He proves how unhinged he is. He's so crazy and volatile. And uh, I think it's just a very cool moment. And it's something that we obviously still talk about to this day because it's just such a great moment, a great return for Terry. Um, and it's a great moment just to put flair over as this, as this baby face now. Well, that was the main event, but we got some bonus content, I suppose. Joe Petticino backstage with Nikita Koloff, who's making his return to the NWA as a referee. He says the Road Warriors nor the Varsity Club will intimidate him in this title match. I didn't do the voice because honestly, this is the most articulate I've heard Nikita Koloff in quite some time. So I wanted to be respectful. Nikita is officiating this match for the NWA WA World Tag Titles as the Varsity Club. Mike Rotunda and Dr. Death Steve Williams take on the Road Warriors. Animal and Hog just get to wailing on their opponents before the bell even rings. The pyro's going off as they do it. It's a war. The match is underway. Referee Koloff ejects Kevin Sullivan right from the get-go. Threatens the DQ, Dr. Death as well. Road Warriors looking strong at the start. Hawk with a diving clothesline off the apron that connects. Goes for another one, but he hits the ring post instead. Things start breaking down. All four men are in the ring for a moment. Rotunda flies out of the ring. Steve Williams is double teamed, hit with the doomsday device. Suddenly, Dan Spivey and Kevin Sullivan pull Nikita out of the ring and start beating him up. Things are out of control. The bell is being rung. The Road Warriors win by DQ, but the titles do not change hands. I give it one star. You know, it was fast paced and physical, what we did see of it, only to have that controversial ending. And that was kind of the, the pattern we had been seeing on television. We've seen these two teams fight in the weeks leading up to this and saw somewhat more of the same. Um, on paper, I'd love to see a full match with the Varsity Club and the Road Warriors. They'd have a great matchup. We just didn't get that on this night. Then in your last match of the evening, we go from the World Tag Titles to the U.S. Tag Titles as Hot Stuff Eddie Gilbert and Rick Steiner defend against Kevin Sullivan and Danny Spivey. There is a lot of heat right now between Kevin and Eddie. You know, it's all focused as well on Missy Hyatt, who is Eddie Gilbert's wife. And so she's accompanying him to ringside. And this is part of Kevin Sullivan's MO. He be attacking wives. You know, we've seen this occasionally in uh, the recaps uh, of his matches I've been covering at this time, and this is really no different here. So you've got this big war between Gilbert and Sullivan, and every time they say those two names like that, it makes me laugh a little bit. Like, why don't they have them just break out in a song whenever they mention that? Like I said, there was supposed to be a hair versus hair stipulation in this matchup, but for whatever reason, they decide to undo it. Anyway, the match begins with a brawl. Spivey taking Rick Steiner out on the outside, attacks his arm as Gilbert and Sullivan fight each other. Gilbert's all on his own against the challengers now. Steiner takes even more punishment on the outside. Rick finally gets his jacket off and is on the apron as the beating against Eddie continues. Rick is tagged in, supposedly. The referee does not see it, though. But in the confusion, Rick hits the Steiner line on Sullivan before a pile driver. Gilbert with the roll-up and the win. Spivey immediately dinks Steiner with the chair. Sullivan pulling Missy Hyatt into the ring with evil intentions. But Eddie Gilbert makes the save for his lady and Kevin makes his escape. I'm going to give it one and a half stars out of five. Now, to their credit, the reality of the situation was a couple of days before this matchup, Rick Steiner suffered a legitimate, a very bad arm injury, and he just couldn't wrestle that night. So this was their workaround. Steiner using his good arm on the Steiner line at the end there, and that was pretty much his only contribution. Uh, they made the best out of a tough situation to be the last match on the show and to have that happen. Um, yeah, I think they carried it pretty well. Gilbert doing a kind of a good, you know, come from behind babyface. The 
valiant effort two on one situation. I thought for that story and given the circumstances going into the match, they did a good job. As the show's wrapping up, Jim Ross announcing that Rotunda and Williams are stripped of the tag titles as a result of what happened in the previous match. There would be an eight team tournament for those belts and they would eventually be won by Michael Hayes and Jimmy Jam Garvin, the Freebirds. My grade for Wrestle War 89 Music City Showdown, the inaugural Wrestle War is a C plus. Now the undercard is pretty flimsy on this one, but it's really the show overall is definitely elevated by the US and world title matches. If you see only one match on this show, Obviously, it's Flair versus Steamboat, but if you see two matches on this show, it's got to be that and uh, Luger versus Hayes. Again, a match I went into with zero expectations, but just totally blew me away for how they took a simple story and made it look so crisp and perfect. People are going to watch this match now and think I'm some weirdo for talking it up the way I have, and they're going to say, what, what's so special about this matchup here? But it's just like, I don't know what how else to describe it. It just like completely uh, shocked me, and I was just enthralled by just how well executed it was. I don't know. But what did you think of Wrestle War 89? Which of the Flair Steamboat matches in their trilogy is your all-time favorite? I want to hear about that in the comments section below. Be sure to give the video a thumbs up if you like it, subscribe to Wrestling with Regret, and hit that bell icon for all the notifications. Next time here on The Review, we're going to stay in the year 1989, the continuation of the epic Flair funk rivalry over the World Championship. We're going to see its dramatic conclusion, not on pay-per-view, but on TBS. We are doing a classic Clash review. It's Clash of the Champions 8, New York Knockout, the I Quit match. But until then, I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.